What is up y'all and welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, my name is Scotty Holiday. I'm a queer creator and a huge Star Wars nerd. So if you're into either one of those things, please consider subscribing for more. In this video, I'm going to be reviewing Andor Episode 7 titled Announcement. This episode expanded and set up so many new plot points and I honestly loved it. Maybe I'm just a sucker for the drama, but there was a lot of cool stuff going on with our characters and I'm so excited to talk about it. This episode also had a lot of Emperor Palpatine name drops throughout, which I'm going to give my thoughts on later, but before we get started, please make sure to like this video and leave a comment letting me know what you thought of episode 7. I'm putting out weekly reviews for each new episode of the Andor series, so make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss out. I've put a link in the cards and in the description to my Andor series playlist where you can watch all my previous Andor videos as well. Now let's dive into this review. The episode starts off with Cyril, the morning of his interview for the Bureau of Standards. His mother questions his brown suit, saying his actions and appearance will reflect on both of them, pointing out his raised collar, which he says he had tailored, of course. <laughs> she tells him it says, look at me, I don't believe in myself, I am desperate for approval. And it's so funny because she's not wrong. Regardless of his outfit, Cyril seeks validation and approval from others and we've seen this since the beginning of the series. It's clear that he's never felt good enough for her, and this feeling of not good enough is constantly in his head with everything he does. She also warns that he's representing not just himself, but his Uncle Harlow, and at this point, I just want to figure out what this Uncle Harlow guy is all about. Their conversation ends as Cyril gets up to watch the news on the Aldani terror attack, as it's described by the newscaster. We learn later on in the episode that the Bureau of Standards is the Star Wars equivalent to an office or call center job. During Cyril's walkthrough of the office, we see an employee that looks very similar to a Chiss, the same species as Grand Admiral Thrawn, marking the first time we've seen someone of the Chiss species in live action. Moving forward, we catch up with the ISB at their morning meeting, which is being led by none other than the now Colonel Wolf Ularin. In the aftermath of the attack, he addresses the meeting saying the only question they need to answer is how tight to close their fist, and informs the supervisors of a tribute tax and revocation of imperial tolerance for any sectors harboring rebel activity or covering it up. He even says he's spoken directly with Emperor Palpatine on the matter and informs them of an emergency Senate session to approve the removal of any limitations to the ISB in dealing with these matters, basically putting the law into the ISB's hands to conduct as they see fit, so essentially totalitarianism. This character has appeared in the Clone Wars series, Star Wars Rebels, A New Hope, and now in Andor. I'm so glad they included him, it totally makes sense, though I do miss his iconic voice from Tom Kane. Next, we visit Luthen's gallery as Mon Mothma arrives to confront him about the Aldani mission. She knows it was his doing and explains that the people will suffer in the aftermath, but Luthen explains this is the only way that people will notice how bad things really are under the Empire, by making them suffer. He tells her, we need the fear, we need them to overreact, and repeats his line to Cassian from the third episode saying, the Empire has been choking us so slowly, we're starting not to notice. He tells her, there will be no rules going forward, and I have to admit, this felt like foreshadowing to his contact with Saw Gerrera. I think there's merit to both sides of the argument though. Luthen knows that the people won't stand up until they're forced to accept how bad things really are, and as Mon says, they will suffer in the aftermath. Once again, we see this show exploring that gray area so well and I continue to love it every time. I also wanted to point out two items we see within Luthen's gallery in these scenes. We got a great look at the Keldor breath mask, and I was also surprised to see a Jedi Temple Guard helmet on display too. I don't remember seeing the helmet previously, so I definitely wanted to make sure I pointed it out just in case you missed it. After this, we follow Clea as she walks through the different streets and corridors of Coruscant. We don't know where she's headed or why, but it seems important since she's got a totally different look than usual. At one point, she passes a group of stormtroopers, and I think this was the perfect time to bring them into the series. Their appearance really helps convey the Empire cracking down. She eventually stops to look down at the floor before continuing, and the camera shows a close-up of a symbol on the floor. I assume there's some kind of importance behind it. I wonder if it could be some sign of the rebels, similar to how the Mythosaur skull symbol is used in the Mandalorian series to mark Mandalorian hideouts and coverts. 
Eventually, she meets up with another person to speak on the Eldani mission, and it wasn't until halfway through their conversation that I realized this person was Vel. I literally yelled, oh fuck, because I was so surprised and I had to start the scene all over. Vel starts by asking why Luthen isn't there, and I have to assume this is because she wants her dad's validation for the success of the mission. I'm still on the Vela's Luthen's daughter train, so, you know. <laughs> they talk about the people lost during the mission. Clay reveals she was the one who recruited Terraman, saying that they'll all be remembered. Emotionless, as usual. <laughs> Vel asks her about Sintas specifically, and Clea says she's doing what she was told, then explains they have a loose end, Cassian, and tasks Vel with tracking him down and killing him, saying this is what revolution looks like. Vel doesn't seem too happy about this task, and it's completely understandable. We also get a quick update with Sinta, showing her packing up the rebel camp on Aldani and looking up to see a massive star destroyer above her in the sky. This scene really conveyed how severely the Empire was cracking down on Aldani, and the reveal of the star destroyer paired with the music in the scene felt very Jedi Fallen Order. Next, I want to talk about Cassian's return to Ferrix. He goes home first to tell Marva about his score and plan to escape, saying, It's all gonna be different now, Ma. It was so special to see him so proud to finally be able to take care of his mother after all these years, and it was a nice parallel to Marva rescuing him on Canari. Cassian also goes to visit Bix to ask her about Luthen and Tim turning him in. She says Tim's motives were probably because he thought they were back together, confirming they've been romantically involved in the past, which was no surprise to me. She tells him he shouldn't be back, explaining that the people of Ferex blame him for the Imperial occupation and won't hesitate to turn him in. Cassian asks her about Luthen, but she says she doesn't have any information on him, as I expected. Before leaving, Cassian tells her that he wants to make sure Luthen knows he held up his end of the bargain and to forget about him, even saying everyone should forget about him on Ferex. To which she responds, I've done it before. And regardless of how she's acting, she obviously still cares about him, and I think he cares about her too. I don't think this is the last time we'll see the two of them together. While Cassian sneaks back to Marva's, we see a flashback to the day his father, Clem, was taken and hanged by the Empire. I didn't realize his father's name was Clem until now, so it all clicked for me finally in this moment. <laughs> in the flashback, we see clone troopers marching through the streets of Ferex as Clem tells Cassian this is not their fight. He tries to calm a group of protesters, but in the heat of it all, the Imperial officer orders the clones to turn on them. At this point, we realize that Clem was executed for a crime he didn't commit. Despite not participating in the protest and actually trying to de-escalate it, he was included solely because he was there. And we see this same kind of situation echoed later on in the episode as well. Once Cassian returns home, Marva tells Cassian that she's going to stay on Ferex, explaining that he can't stay and she can't go. She tells him they can't outrun the Empire and says she was inspired by the rebel attack on Aldani. She knows she has to stand up to the Empire right where she is instead of running from them, which is essentially the opposite of what Cassian is trying to do. But he tells her he's going to come back to Ferex no matter what. Marva also tries to reason with Cassian, telling him to forget searching for his sister, reminding him there were no survivors on Canari. She knows he feels guilty and responsible for what happened there, but tries to make him recognize that it wasn't his fault. This part of their conversation made me feel torn, like I understand what she was trying to say, I just don't know if she explained it in the best way. It was also really great to see B2 again, I really missed him and all of his cuteness. The next big event that took place in the episode was the party at Mon Mothma's home. During the party, we meet Tay Colma, a banker from Chandrilla, and the person Mon Mothma wants to bring into the circle. As they walk through the party together, she prefaces the conversation saying, I need your help. I want to tell you something that only three people in the galaxy know about. And I have to assume those three people are Luthen, Clea, and Bail Organa. Before continuing, Tay tells her he's grown weary of the Empire and that his politics may be a bit strong for her taste, but she continues explaining that the Mon Mothma people think they know is a lie. She says it's a projection or front, which she learned from none other than Palpatine. 
Once she feels confident enough to confide in him, she reveals that the Grand Vizier has infiltrated her separatist coalition meetings and that her driver Chloris is an ISB plant. There's even ISB agents at the party. She says she's raising money and needs help accessing her family accounts, and wants Tay to be the chairman of a Chandrillan charitable outreach program. One of her benevolent and useless irritations, as she puts it. When he asks her what it's for, she says he's better off not knowing, and repeats his line, perhaps you'd find my politics a bit strong for your taste. Judging by his smirk at the end of the conversation, I think he understands. I also have to say, I think there's some romantic chemistry between them. In an interview, Tony Gilroy stated that Mon and Perrin had somewhat of an arranged marriage at 16, and just from this episode alone, I feel like she's actually always been in love with Tay. The looks, the smiles, the slight flirtatiousness, walking arm in arm, it's all there. She really lights up, and I feel like it's made clear that Tay knows the real Mon Mothma behind it all. She calls him one of her oldest friends, and they definitely have a history. During their conversation, Tay even tells her, life takes us where it will, which felt very on the nose for their relationship. Even the way he asks her if her request is personal or political, the conversation really could have been perceived at first as her wanting to admit her feelings for him. It really reminded me of Obi-Wan and Duchess Satine's relationship seen throughout the Clone Wars series. Both Obi-Wan and Satine sacrificed their love for one another for duty, and I think that's exactly what Tay Colma and Mon Mothma have done. I wish she would just leave Perrin for Tay, especially after she tells him Perrin is not to be trusted. I just really want her to be happy. Now of course, I have to talk about my girl Dedra Miro and her girl bossing in this episode. Towards the end of the episode, we see another ISB meeting where Supervisor Blevin attempts to lodge a charge against her for sector protocol violations comprising Imperial safety. Major Partagas questions his motives, but Dedra allows him to continue. When questioned, she informs them that she used the data she collected to provide data backing up her claims of rebel activity spread through the galaxy from Andor Episode 4. Blevin rebutes, saying, Imagine if everyone in this room played as loose as the roles as she did, but to everyone's surprise, including my own, Major Partagaz says, Excellent suggestion, and reassigns the Morlana sector, including Ferex, to Dedra for her efforts. It was so satisfying to see, and I literally cheered for her. She's literally my problematic girl boss, and I love her. It's so crazy that I'm rooting for an Imperial, but that's the beauty of the character work and the writing in this show. The last few scenes I wanted to talk about happen after a time jump. Cassian wasn't kidding when he suggested escaping to somewhere warm and easy, because he literally goes to Space Florida. <laughs> We learn that he's taken on a secret identity to evade the Empire, and he leaves his home to run to the store, but gets caught in the crossfire of some people running from Imperial Shore Troopers. Knowing he's still a wanted man, he cautiously heads the other way, but gets stopped by another trooper for looking suspicious. Just like his father Clem, Cassian gets wrongly accused for a crime he wasn't even a part of. The trooper questions him, trying to coerce Cassian into admitting he was a part of whatever was going on, and getting him worked up just so the trooper can pull the you need to calm down sir card. People say the phrase, looking for trouble, about people they think look suspicious, but in most situations like this, it's really the authorities looking for trouble in someone. They use their power to apprehend Cassian with no actual evidence, and this tactic is something we see way too much in the real world between the police and minorities specifically. I'm glad the show addressed this not only once, but twice within the episode. As the troopers go to apprehend the others involved, they call over a KX series droid, the same as K2SO from Rogue One, to hang on to Cassian until the others are caught. The droid continues to repeat the word hang to Cassian as it slams him up against the wall by his throat, and I have to wonder if he thought about Clem in this moment. The trauma! Of course this scene also immediately made me think of K2, and I hope it's a tease that we're gonna get to see him soon. In the end, Cassian is taken in front of a judge and given a six year sentence for these supposed crimes. On a less serious note though, I have to talk about that shower scene. I did not realize how sexy Diego Luna was until we saw him shirtless at the end of the episode. Those pecs, so hot. Star Wars has started a new trend showing our leading men shirtless with Book of Boba Fett, Kenobi, and now Andor, and I really hope they continue because we are being fed. 
I also loved the music at the beginning of the scenes and during the credits. All the music in this series so far has been so good, but this piece really stuck out as a favorite for me. So just like last week, where do you think this show is going to go from here? We're definitely going to see that prison break that was teased in the trailer soon, but I kind of hope we get a little break from Cassian's story. I'd love to see a Mon Mothma and Luthen centric episode. Both characters had a lot set in motion, so I'd really like to see more on their side of things while Cassian is behind bars. We also got a lot of Emperor Palpatine name drops in the episode, and I have to wonder if they're teasing a big Palpatine cameo before the end of the season. The series has done a lot of teasing from Perrin's dinner party guests to Senate meetings and now Palpatine, so I hope we actually get to see some of it going forward. Let me know what you think down in the comments below, or hit me up on Twitter so we can chat more about it. I'm putting out weekly reviews for each new episode of Andor as they air, so please make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss out. I've put a link to my Andor series playlist with all of my previous episode reviews in the description and on the end screen of this video please consider checking them out and leaving a like. I really appreciate all of your support so much. Make sure to like this video and consider subscribing to my channel for more Star Wars content. To keep up with my latest updates, you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram. My links are in the description below. Thank you so much for watching and as always, may the force be with you.